Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. It's good to see everybody in this afternoon, and uh, for those of you joining us on television, again, we're just a simple Bible study, and uh, we, uh, we don't hold to any denominational line. We're just going to teach the book where we feel the Spirit leads us to teach it, and uh, evidently it's working. We're getting response from every imaginable background you can think of, and uh, they all tell me pretty much the same thing. Less it isn't you, it's the Word, especially as we put it on the screen. So we do thank you, every one of you out there, for your prayers and your letters and for everything that makes this ministry work. All right, for those of you here in the studio, we've already been turned to Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to pick up where we left off in our last four programs. And uh, just for a quick review now, remember that we're going to be moving to the place where we can hopefully show beyond a shadow of a doubt that we can rest on a pre-tribulation outcalling of the church, which we call the rapture. Now, one of the big arguments that they throw at me is, well, the word rapture isn't even in the Bible. And you know what I say? Neither is the word trinity. Neither is the word sovereign. But do we use them? All the time. And uh, same way with the word rapture. It is in the Roman uh, Catholic Vulgate, but uh, not that that makes it any more secure, but nevertheless, they translated the caught up in First Thessalonians as rapture, from which I guess the English got the rapture. But anyhow, we're not showing it just from one or two verses. We're going to use however many programs it takes to show the big picture, and that's what I'm always referring to. We have to look at the big picture. How did all these things come about that bring us to and a necessity of an outcalling of the body of Christ before God picks up his dealing with the nation of Israel. And uh, as I pointed out then in our last taping, in those first four programs, you cannot recognize this unless you look at the Scriptures dispensationally, which, of course, a lot of these covenant people despise and uh, they almost hate it. But uh, that's their problem, not mine because it's still the only viable way to study is to rightly divide the Scriptures, not just between Malachi and Matthew, but we divide the Scriptures between the various dispensations when God dealt differently with the human race over different periods of time. And that's the whole idea of dispensational teaching, is how did God deal? And I always start out with Adam and Eve in the garden. It's the simplest and the easiest dispensation to describe. He placed them in the garden, and he gave them a set of directions. Just like a pharmacist puts it on the bottle when you get your prescription, and you've got a, a parallel there. A dispensation is like a dispensing of a prescription. Well, what good is a prescription if it doesn't have directions? And the same way with a dispensation. When God established a dispensation, he gave a set of directions. Now, coming back to Adam and Eve again, their set of directions was simple. Of that one tree you shall not eat. The rest is yours to enjoy. But of that one tree, you shall not eat. That was it. But they couldn't even follow that. <laughs> it wasn't long until Satan hoodwinked them and they ate of the tree. Well, that ended that dispensation with a judgment, which was the expulsion out of the garden. And you start up with another dispensational program. And so all the way up through human history, God has dealt at different times under different circumstances with different sets of directions. All right, now then, of course, when Moses and the children of Israel came to Mount Sinai and God put them under the law, basically from the Ten Commandments and then everything that was associated with it. So for 1,500 years, much longer time than Adam and Eve in the garden, but for 1,500 years then, Israel lived and practiced under the law. And uh, it was a set of directions. Well, when they rejected everything that God had promised under that dispensation, which was really the coming of their Messiah to be their king, and instead of recognizing him and taking him and trusting him as their king, they did what? They crucified him. They killed him. And, of course, that precipitated a judgment, which ended then, of course, with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 A.D., and Israel sent out into a dispersion that took them to every nation under heaven. None accepted. 
But that was exactly what prophecy said would happen. But prophecy also said that after they've been scattered to every nation under heaven, what would God do? He would bring them back. And of course, we've seen that happen in our lifetime. And so that's all a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. But you see, God cannot really enter into a dispensational relationship with Israel again with the church here on earth because that would be a mix that just wouldn't fly. And uh, so we're showing now that after Israel rejected everything, God did something totally different by taking one man, the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, and told him, I will send you to the Gentiles, which was just exactly opposite of what he told the Twelve. See, now that's when people think Scripture uh, contradicts itself. Well, if you don't understand the change of operations, yes. But when there is a distinct contradiction, it's not a contradiction. It's a change in dispensation. It's a state change in program. And so now when Jesus told the twelve, go not to the Gentile, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and Israel rejected everything and crowned it with the stoning of Stephen, we're introduced to the next player on the stage of biblical history, Saul of Tarsus. And uh, then in chapter 9, as we saw last time we were together, Saul was not only transformed and saved, as we call it, but he was designated then by God himself from glory as the one who would go now to the Gentile, just opposite of what Jesus told the Twelve. And uh, then if you remember, in the last couple programs, we were following the transition through the book of Acts where the Apostle Paul is now coming front and center and Peter and the Eleven are just sort of slipping off the scene because God is now changing his modus operandi from dealing with Israel under the law and he's going to be dealing with the Gentile world as well as some Jews, of course, under grace. A whole different set of directions. All right, so now then, just to pick us up where we left off, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 3. We'll start at verse 1, but I want us to home in on verse 2. It's one of the verses we got here on the board. All four of these verses use the term dispensation. So I can stand here without apology and tell the world it's a biblical word. It's not a coined word. It's not an invented word. It's right out of the original Greek, a dispensation, a period of time where God is dealing with the human race under a set of, uh, set of directions. All right, Ephesians 3, verse 1. <clears throat> For this cause, and of course that's a reflection on the first two chapters. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for whom? Gentiles. See, now what a difference. Everything else, all the way up since Genesis chapter 12, whenever God spoke, who was he speaking primarily to? Israel. Israel was under the promises. Israel was under the covenants. When Christ came his earthly ministry, like we've already said, he told the twelve, go not into the way of a Gentile, but go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Everything was directed to the nation of Israel. Now this apostle directs everything the other direction. He's always making reference to the Gentiles. See, and that's what people have to realize. You know, uh, once in a while I'll, I'll get a a letter, usually from preachers, who just totally disagree with me. And I just come up with one short stock answer. The only reason you can't see what I'm doing is you don't want to. That's the only reason. Because if they want to, they see it. I've got pastors all around the country now that are beginning to see it. I've already made mention of that. And uh, why? Because they suddenly realize, hey, if I'm wrong, I want to see it. But if they don't want to, Nothing I can do, nothing anybody else can do short of God himself because they're not going to see it if they don't want to. And you know the reason they usually don't want to? Peer pressure. Peer pressure. Just like with our kids. What's the worst thing that our teenagers have to face every day? Peer pressure. The other kids. Well, what's the worst pressure that preachers have to face? Other preachers. See, now I was with a couple of them down in Florida. They know exactly what I'm talking about. All the rest of the preachers in their community you just almost detest them, won't have anything to do with them because they don't like this approach to Scripture. Well, you know, what are we going to do about it? If they want to see it, they'll see it. All right, so here we go. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if 
And again, remember, by the time Paul has written Ephesians, he's been out there amongst the Gentile world about 24 years. If I got my chronology right, I think he started about 40 A.D., and this is written about 64, so that's 24 years that he has been ministering to the Gentile world. Now, you want to remember that was a rather small area compared to now. It was the area around the Mediterranean, Turkey predominantly, and Greece, and uh, then uh, some, of course, in uh, Antioch and Syria. But that was about the extent of the then known world so far as the Christian message was concerned. So he says, if, after 24 years of his ministry, you happen to be among those who have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God. Now watch this next few words. This dispensation which is given, and I'm going to put the preposition only for clarity, which is given to me, to you. Now what's the process? God unveiled this whole body of truth that we call the dispensation of grace. And he did not tell Paul to take it to Israel. He told Paul to take it where? To the Gentile world. And that's exactly what he did. And he had to fight the Jewish element almost all the way because they were never convinced that the God of Israel would have anything to do with those pagan Gentiles. And we were looking at it before... Uh, taping today, and I can't put my finger on the verse, I'll have to find it. But you see, when God brought Israel out of Egypt and was preparing them for the promised land, what were they to do with all those pagan Gentiles into whose midst they would be going? Now, we don't like to say it because it's so much against our biblical culture now under, under Christendom, at least, but what were the instructions? Don't spare a one. Clean the country of them. Don't intermarry with them. Don't do business with them. Have nothing to do with the Gentile world around you. Well, you see, that stayed with Israel all the way up through, you might say, until we get to the Apostle Paul, because even Peter, as we showed in our last taping, when God forced the issue for him to go to that Gentile house of Cornelius, did Peter want to go? Heavens, no. He was a good law-keeping Jew. And you remember the last thing he said when he went across the threshold? Cornelius, you know, having served the Roman army here in Israel all these years, you know it's an unlawful thing for me, a Jew, to keep company with someone of another nation. Not just Rome. Any Gentile nation the Jews were to have nothing to do with. Well, you see... That just carried over then into all these elements of taking salvation to the Gentile world. Those Jewish people couldn't handle the fact that God was going to share himself with those pagan Gentiles. But he says this is what we're going to do. All right, now then we have to go on into verse 3. How did this new apostle, with no association with the twelve whatsoever, now he is being told what to take to the Gentile world so far as salvation message was concerned. Where did he get it? Verse 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me, not us, not himself and the twelve, but to him alone. And to me was made known the mystery, which we told you last time we were together, is secret things that had never been revealed before. And you see, this is what most of Christendom can't get through their head. They just can't get it through their head that all these things that are pertinent for us in this age of grace were totally unknown. Totally And that's why Paul refers to it over and over as things that were kept secret. They were mysteries. And you see, whenever I get a letter of opposition, I don't get many. Don't, don't worry, I'm not complaining. My, I'm not complaining a bit. It's very rare that I get a letter of opposition. But all I have to do is just skim through it. Not one verse, not one reference from the Apostle Paul. Well, where does that letter go? Well, in the round file. If they don't know enough of Scripture to use nothing out of Paul, then there's no need for me to respond. But that's what they do. They just utterly ignore the Apostle Paul. And I've made this cry from this 
pulpit, if you want to call it that, for as long as I've been in television. Why in the world are 90% of your Sunday morning sermons any place but Paul? And you all know that. I shared it uh, with a fellow who kept track in one of the major denominations several years ago in one of my classes. From January till the 1st of July, he kept a log of every Sunday morning sermon text. Not one was from Paul. All but one was from Matthew or John. Some of them were from Mark and Luke, I guess. Mostly from Matthew. One was from the Old Testament. Well, that's typical. That didn't surprise me one bit because they will not recognize that to this apostle were given things that were never even alluded to anywhere else in Scripture. And that's what makes it so unique, it's unique and why it is so hard for people to swallow. Well, I woke up in the middle of the night, and you know I do that quite often the night before taping, and you know a verse just hit me. And I'm going to have you look at it because I think the Lord did it for a reason. Turn back with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. No, not chapter 1. Uh, 2 Timothy, chapter 1. 2 Timothy. Now this, of course, is toward the end of Paul's prison ministry. He may have been free for a little while before... No, not in 2 Timothy. That would have been 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy is just before he's martyred. I'm sorry. 2 Timothy is written now at the end of his life. It won't be long after this and... They'll be beheading him. But look what he writes. And, and this just says it all when, when I tell what I've just told you in the last five minutes. Hey, it's nothing new. It's nothing new. And we have to be aware of that. Verse 15 of 2 Timothy 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. At the end of his ministry... And here he's been out there just simply sacrificing, suffering in the physical like I don't think any other man ever suffered outside of Christ himself. And look what he writes. This thou knowest, that all they that are in Asia, now that would be Turkey. You want to remember that Asia in our New Testament is Asia Minor or the land of Turkey. Now stop and think a minute. Where was Turkey in Paul's ministry. Well, almost the very heart of it. If he went north from Antioch, he'd go up to the Cilician Straits, and he could go straight west across the highlands of Turkey, and then he would hit the little cities of Derby and Lystra and uh, Antioch of Pisidia, and all the way on over to the western coast of Turkey on the Aegean Sea, where he had the city of Ephesus primarily and then uh, across, of course, to Philippi. But a good portion, you see, of his ministry was in what we call the land of Turkey. Now, I'll picture that a minute before we read on. The land of Turkey was where he spent a good portion of his time. All right? This thou knowest, that all they who are in Asia, or Turkey, be turned away from me the worst of which was Vagellus and Homogenes. Now, stop and think a minute. Were they turning against the man, Paul, or his message? The message. The message. It wasn't that they didn't like Paul the man, but oh, just like today, they couldn't stand his message. Now, think a little deeper. See, that's what I like to do if, if I can succeed in teaching, is getting people to think. Since all of the land of Turkey, after his 24 years of labor, ended up turning against him, where did Turkey end up spiritually now in the last 2,000 years? Nothing. Muslim, if anything, and they're even secular. Oh, that just tells me everything. They rejected Paul's message, and they went back probably to Christ's earthly ministry in the 12. And I was reading an article the other day by a Ph.D. theologian. And all he was stressing was the teachings of Jesus. Oh, wait a minute. Who was Jesus teaching? Jews. Jews under the law. 
And so not much of his teaching is really that relevant for us today. Oh, there's nothing wrong with them. But see, that's not where the heart of the matter is for us today. He was laboring under the law with the temple worship tied in with it, and it was all concerning his covenant people. But you see, none of that really becomes pertinent for us today because between that and now was the what? The cross. See, and I love that old hymn. I'm sure many of you know it. The cross makes a difference. It makes all the difference, see? And they don't see that. All right, so just mull this over. What happened to the land of Turkey when all of the Pauline churches turned against him? They became nothing. Nothing. And then I read something else the other night that confirmed what I have been telling my classes for 30-some years. You watch Turkey. Everybody is trying to pull them into the European community, and they've been part of NATO. But what has been my stand? They're going to go to the Muslim world by the time we get to the end. So what did you read the other night? They're that close now to fu fulfilling that prophetic part of it, that they are going to hook up with the Muslim world. You know, a few years ago, they even made a treaty with Israel that you wondered how in the world could Turkey make a treaty like that with the Jews when the rest of the Middle East is so against that. But see, now they've just about thrown that out already and uh, they're getting more belligerent toward the little nation of Israel every day. So all of these things are coming together now right in front of our very eyes. But all right, don't forget this, that the Apostle Paul at the close of his life could write to Timothy that all they in Asia, all those little congregations that he had established had turned not against him, I don't think, the person, but against his message the gospel of the grace of God. All right, now in the few minutes we have left, this is almost gone already. Let's just go back to Ephesians chapter 3 for a little longer because I'm going to spend the next whatever it takes to review of what we taught verse by verse 10 years ago. Isn't that about when we were in Romans, honey? About 96, 97? That's 10 years ago already. And uh, so I don't think it would hurt us a bit to go back and review some of these things that are pertinent to Paul's message for the Gentile world. All right, if you're back in Ephesians chapter 3, how that the dispensation of the grace of God was given to him to give it to the Gentile world, and in that process of handing out the directions for this dispensation, here's how he got it. Verse 3, how that by revelation, a revealing of things that had been kept under wraps, how that by revelation he, God, made known unto me the mystery, the things kept secret, as I wrote before in few words, whereby when you read, you, now remember who he's writing to, writing to Gentiles, not just the Ephesians. This, this is a, a circulated letter, and so it's just as relevant for us as it was for them in the day he wrote it. Whereby you, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery or the secret things of Christ. Now, that immediately reminds me of a verse. Go back with me to Galatians. Just a few pages back. To Galatians chapter 2 when we're at that Jerusalem Council, and I use these verses over and over, I'm always afraid I might be doing it too much. I don't like to run anything into the ground, but there is so much here that the world of Christendom totally refuses to consider. Galatians chapter 2, and they're at that big Jerusalem Council in about 51 A.D., which actually took place about six, seven years before he wrote the letter to the Galatians if you want to go by chronology. But look what happened. He's meeting with the twelve up there at the Jerusalem church. And jump in at verse 6. I'll be coming back to this again, so bear with me, because these things are so pertinent to our understanding, our dispensational stand on Paul's revelation of the mysteries. All right, verse 6 of Galatians 2. But of these who seem to be somewhat, now he's referring to the twelve, 
Whatsoever they were makes no matter to me. God accepts no man's person just because they can say, well, I'm one of the twelve. Well, that, that didn't cut any muster with, with Paul. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference. Now, there's a key, con key statement. When they compared their theological notes in conference, they, the twelve, added nothing to me. In other words, they didn't have anything new that they could share with this apostle. Nothing. But on the other hand, next verse, see? When they, the twelve, saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, the Gentile world that we're just looking at now in Ephesians 3, when they recognized that this gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was committed unto Peter. Then verse 8, For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same with mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James and Peter and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived or understood the grace that was given unto me. Well, where'd that grace come from? The ascended Lord in glory, see? And uh, I, I was looking for another word when he said, uh, oh, I know where it is. I'm sorry, I, I have another verse in mind. We still got time. Real quickly, turn to Second Peter, chapter 3. Second Peter, chapter 3. It still came from the same person, but it's in a different place. I was thinking it was back there in Galatians. But look what Peter writes, and we've looked at these verses hundreds of times. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And all this to make the point that these revelations, these revealings of mysteries from the ascended Lord to this apostle was what made the difference. All right, verse 15. Account or understand that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom of given unto him. What do you suppose Peter is referring to in that word wisdom? The revelation of these mysteries. An understanding of things that had been kept totally secret. You couldn't go back to the Old Testament and say, well, here it is. Couldn't go back to Christ's earthly ministry and say, here it is. No. Those were things that had been kept totally secret until revealed. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Veldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.